All right. Good afternoon. Thank you, or everyone, for joining us to talk about session numbers. <laughs> um, want to take a moment for introductions. Um, we have with us today Christina Eaton, principal librarian at the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. And I remember meeting uh, Christina when she was working at the National Symphony Orchestra Library here in Washington, D.C. And then I think I went out and visited you when you were in, was it Phoenix? In Phoenix, yeah. Yes, yeah. that was, I mean, National was my very first library job. That was more years ago than I like to think. <laughs> hey, don't, don't date me there. <laughs> <laughs> And we also have with us Russ Gersberger. He's the librarian at the U.S. Naval School of Music in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, Russ also worked at the U.S. Marine Band like I did, but we did not cross paths there. He went on to uh, New England Conservatory. And I believe while you were in Boston, you were also helping out at the Boston Symphony. Is that correct? When they were desperate. Yep. <laughs> I think they were very happy to have you. And you are also at the Juilliard School in New York City, correct? Correct. Uh, so we have an interesting mix of backgrounds uh, here. So like I said, I was at the U.S. Marine Band as well, and now I'm here at the Music Division at the Library of Congress. In my current role, I don't have any need to be worried about accession numbers. So it's fun to go back and talk about this <laughs> um, with, with you two who are more immediately dealing with, with such beasts. Uh, so let's dive right in. I'm going to be peppering you all with questions. Uh, and... For those of you joining us, um, please go ahead and ask questions as we go. Don't wait, the, you know, you're welcome to ask at the end, but I, you know, if you have questions, go ahead and ask them. And since I can no longer see the chat bar, Amy, you may have to help me um, with the questions, if that's okay. Yep, no problem. Great, thank you so much. <laughs> And we, many, many thanks to Amy Tackett for setting this up and facilitating this. Uh, we really appreciate it. And she's also recording it and we'll make sure that recording is available later. So yay, thank you so much, Amy. <laughs> it's a great service to MOLA. So Russ, do you wanna start us off here by talking about the two different systems of organization? Well, it kind of comes down to two reasonably simple systems, alphabetically or numerically. And fortunately, most people can handle either system. They're reasonably uh, easy to understand, but they have different structures and benefits and uh, let's say not benefits. <laughs> not so much uh, bad structure, bad reasoning for them, but uh, some have are better suited to larger collections, some to smaller collections. So let's say um, start for alphabetically, because that's one most people have. Small libraries work well with alphabetical collections. And you can arrange them one of two ways. You can go by composer, so Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, or you can go by title, uh, symphony, um, any number of things. And there's different structures then, and good and bad about both of those. So let's say if you go by composer, easy to find what you're looking for. I know some conductors who like to browse for their programs in a system like that. And everybody knows their alphabetical order. But the drawback is that, let's say if you have things arranged on your shelf, you buy a new piece by Bach, you might have to shift everything else in your library to fit that new piece of music in there. You're constantly adjusting room on the shelf because you never know what you're going to buy next. Uh, you also should consider applying what we call a secondary level of organization. That is, uh, if you have several pieces by Beethoven, you can't just lump them on the shelf. You're going to want to give some structure to those. So you might want to put your Beethoven collection by title. So you'll have Egmont, Leonore, the symphonies, so that you can easily find anything in your Beethoven collection, no matter how large it is. And then you're also going to have to consider standardizing the names in your title. So Tchaikovsky is always a good example. Some spell it with a T, some start it with a C, or even uh, names that are uh, might not consider to be giving you a problem like Weber or Von Weber. You're going to have to make some of these decisions so that you know where your music is located on the shelf and hopefully so that everybody else who uses your library can also find the music that you're looking for. 
Any questions about that so far? Probably not. Let's say, continuing with the alphabetical arrangement, you want to put things in your library by title. Of course, everybody knows the alphabet, easy to find things for the most part. But again, there's some drawbacks with this system as well. So you also have to allow some space on each of your shelves for growth. So that you can fit that cantata here in the C's and make room for everything further down as you buy a new piece of music. Here, you might also want to apply another secondary level. So if you have a bunch of symphonies, you should probably arrange those alphabetically by the composer so that you can find your Beethoven symphonies, your Tchaikovsky, everything else in between. So you're adding an extra level of organization onto both of these alphabetical systems. You also have to standardize your titles. So you, most of us do this anyway, if we have some kind of uh, cataloging system, cards or a database, so that if you're playing from say an old Calmus edition that says Thieving Magpie, and you get a nice new edition that's under the Italian title, the Casaladro, well, which title will you use? Do you consolidate them together? Do you separate them out? That's gonna be difficult to find one or the other if you don't know the other one exists. So you're gonna to have to organize those titles somehow. And then also maybe format. Let's say you have a piano concerto, the music might say piano concerto, others might say concerto for piano. You're gonna to have to make a decision one way or another, what way to go, how to standardize those titles. So there's the good and bad with some of the alphabetical systems. For numerical systems, uh, those tend to work very well for large collections. I have in my library now uh, over 10,000 concert band titles, and I can't imagine arranging those by title or composer. A numerical arrangement is the only way to go because that also allows for unlimited growth. If I get another new title next week, I give it the next number in line and I put it at the end. So I can maximize my shelf space, fill up all those shelves, and I only have to worry about adding titles at the very end of my shelving system. Uh, everybody seems to know numbers for the most part, so that's a pretty easy system to apply. Uh, you can also give each piece a fixed location. So if you're looking for piece number 115, you know it's going to be on the shelf between 114 and 116. That's always got a designated home. And uh, it can also help you designate between, say, same sets of a similar work. I should say, let's say you have a, a set of the Beethoven fifth and you have one for your music director and you have another one that you keep for guest conductors. If you want to identify these, you can shelve them together if in, in the alphabetical system, but with a numeric system, they each have a designated number, a specific home so that you can easily tell one from the other. Now the drawbacks with a numerical system is, harder to browse for that conductor who likes to program off the shelf. That's going to be a little bit more different because everything's intermingled. It's going to require diligent record keeping on the part of you, the librarian. And in part, because uh, if you look on the piece of music, if you assign number 115 to this new piece, that number is not going to be any place on the music. It's something that you have applied in your library. So you're going to have to Make sure that number appears on all inventories, on all folders, on all parts with a rubber stamp or a number, certainly in your database as well. Um, one difficulty I had when I got to, uh, uh, it was New England Conservatory, and they gave me the Wind Ensemble Collection. The first thing I had to do was to reconcile all the multiple sets. This had been handled by student conductors over the years, and if they bought a new set of the Holst first suite and neglected to give it a number or neglected to record that number on the catalog cards, it was as good as lost. And sure enough, I found five different sets of the Holst suite that had been purchased over the years because record keeping wasn't necessarily a priority for these students. So you as a librarian have to keep good records, your database, your catalog cards, all your inventory sheets, and on the music itself so that you can find this music wherever it may lay. That is a lot of information. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it just kept going, so. And horrifying about uh, Holst. Ooh. 
Um, Christina, I actually, I just remembered as he was talking that when I visited you in Phoenix, you were shifting because I think that was an alphabetical system, right? That is absolutely right. Um, so here in Cincinnati, we largely use a numerical system. We have a couple subsets that I can talk about. Um, but my previous orchestra was the Phoenix Symphony, and that was an alphabetical library. And I was absolutely the almost one of the first things I did there was was a shift. We actually bought some additional shelving um, and uh, needed to give ourselves, you know, six or eight inches on every shelf. So it is a lot of work. It's a lot of moving. Um, and and in that, that was a much smaller library, but I certainly found works that I didn't know were there. Um, <laughs> uh, in the process of, of giving it a shift. And it's funny. I never thought about it. Like, I always thought that that shifting, like you might have to do it once a year, once every couple of years. And I thought, oh, that is just awful, a whole lot of work. But then to hear that it actually is kind of good for house cleaning. <laughs> it, yeah, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> I mean, it hurts, but, uh, it helps also. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did you have to do that kind of shifting more than once while you were there? Um, I was there for three years and I did it at the beginning of my tenure and not again okay. um they actually moved to new office space not long after i left so the librarian immediately following me um had a much bigger move on his hands <laughs> uh, but hopefully he built it in some room for himself as well and so the numerical system was already in place at cincinnati when you got there that's correct yep actually similar to as russ mentioned we have almost ten thousand sets in our primary collection um uh we in Cincinnati, um, we don't own our hall, Music Hall, um, but we're the primary resident along with some other resident companies. Um, and we are the hired band for Cincinnati Opera and Cincinnati Ballet. So their libraries are within our space as well. Um, they're much smaller collections in terms of number of titles, although an opera set or a ballet set takes up a lot more space. Um, so those those um, collections are actually alphabetical by composer. Um, so I, I represent both options here in, the, in my own library. Um, oh, wow. I so didn't realize we, that. I always think of you as very numerical shop. And mo I mean, the, like I said, the, the primary, our primary collection is numerical. Um, the opera and ballet are, I don't know, 100, 150 titles. So it's much smaller, but um, uh, the opera collection actually is growing um, with excerpts, which is, is, is already a problem space-wise. Um, we were fortunate enough and we did a lot of, of library cataloging and maintenance um, in the 16-17 season. Our hall was renovated, so we seized it as an opportunity to um, really clean house. We, we did a, a literal piece-by-piece on-the-shelf inventory of every piece on our shelves, um, as well as the opera and the ballet before we brought them in and uh, our resident choruses, we did the whole nine yards. Um, so it was a great opportunity to do a little bit of calling, um, retire some works that that um, were not in circulation anymore, designate some as um, we actually called them resurrected from dead storage because they're not in active use, but they have a historical value. So they're on the shelf. Um, uh, but we have a, a much clearer idea of what is in circulation now. Awesome. Are you thinking about changing any of those um, smaller collections over to a miracle system at all? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, although we we do have to find a little bit more room for the opera collection, like we like is ever the the problem. Um, I don't. Uh, they grow. They do one excerpt concert a year, basically. So, you know, it adds four or five titles. It's not a huge growth rate, but it's enough that we've noticed it already. Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to really put you on the spot about this mm -hmm. one. With your various experience and libraries of several sizes, when when do you think for you would be the breaking point? When do you think, oh gosh, okay, this is unwieldy. This I can't deal with this anymore. Like it has to go numerical now. Uh, I think I'm not sure I have a number in mind, but I think it's it's relative. I think it's a relatively low number. I mean, for any orchestra that has, I don't know, more than, I don't know, 10, 12 classics. And then when you get into pops titles, which do you, you know, we talked about alphabetically, but are you alpha by composer or arranger? Um, I think it very quickly makes more sense to go numerically if you have a, if you have a good cataloging system so that you can search by any of those. 
Oh, I'm seeing a question. Um, for opera excerpts, we since the opera collections are alphabetically by composer and then inside of each composer by opera title, we usually go full opera first and then the excerpts right next to it. Pat, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, please let me know if I I didn't if I read too quickly and didn't actually answer your question. Um, but yeah, it sounds like you do house them more with the operas rather than just orchestral music. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's more of an ownership that in that case, it's more of an ownership question because since we're the hired band, it's the opera's collection. Um, and we have we have agreements about how we house their music and that kind of thing. Um, so that's that's why they're filed together. Great. Yeah. Do you have to deal with offsite storage at all? Or is everything? No, um, okay, good. Following, yes, <laughs> following our renovation and prior to renovation, we had cubby holes all over this large building. The other companies had did have offsite storage in some cases. Um, so in the renovation, we brought everything into you know under one roof, under one non-water-based fire suppression system. Um, but we don't, we have, we have a finite amount of space. We are, we were told very clearly that these are the walls in which we operate. So we have been, you know, like with shoes or anything else, um, you know, new one in, we try and see if there's an old one that should go out at the same time. So excellent stewardship. <laughs> we're trying, <laughs> trying. Russ, have you always worked in numerical libraries or have you worked in alphabetical ones? Largely numerical with a few caveats. When I got to NEC, it had been turned over to numerical by Rob Olivier, uh, but it had started under Betty Burnett as an alphabetical system. And when Rob reached that tipping point and decided to number everything for a certain number of amount of repertoire, I could go to the alphabet in the first half of the room and find most of what I wanted. So it was clear that he said, this is when we've got to change and just started applying numbers to everything, which we continued and it was definitely the right move. We had grown exponentially from that time. At Juilliard, we had, uh, when I got there, it was an odd system. It was alphabetically and alphabet and numerical. So let's say um, the Bs, there was B1 would be Bartok Concerto, and then it would jump to B5 would be the Bartok Music for Strings, something like that. And whoever they had designed this had left gaps in there, I suppose, so you could fill in as you got more pieces. So B2, 3, 4 were open. But in some areas, when we bought a lot of Stravinsky while I was there, we ran out of these intervening numbers. And then what do you do? Do you go to decimal points? Well, that's another kettle of fish right there and can be even more confusing to find things as well as to explain it to someone. Just before I left, I had started to put things in a numerical order and I'm not sure what Lisa has been doing since. I didn't get to finish it before I left, but that was a, a project that needed to be reconciled. It's funny you mentioned that, Russ, the, the lowest numbers of our collection also had clearly started alphabetically by composer and had numbers applied to them that might be a very common occurrence, and then we've just continued it. Yeah. Now, um, we have, and I know the Marine Band has the same thing, uh, different collections. So we have a, a concert band collection, a march collection, a big band collection. Those have numbers, but they also have a two-letter prefix. And I think the Marine Band has something similar. The prefix helps identify not only the collection that the material belongs to, but in some part also where it lays on the shelf. So if I know my concert band, if I am looking for something with a CB pre prefix, is going to be in this area. The marches are going to be in this area. And generally, it's arranged by ensemble and somewhat by size at the same time. But I've got the number and I just apply that. So in addition to the prefix, the number program stays the same. The next new piece comes at the end. Actually, Christina, we, when we were talking about this heading up to that, uh, I have a real problem in my library now with open numbers. Mm -hmm. At some point, one of my predecessors decided we need to put all the large woodwind and brass ensemble pieces in with the concert band music. And then 
Someone later said, no, that's a stupid idea. Let's take those out. When they took them out, they didn't fill in those numbers. So now I know I have more than 10,000 titles, but I'm not entirely sure the total number I have in the library because there's lots of gaps in there. You guys, when you were saying that you, you never uh, have open numbers, you keep your numbers assigned to a certain piece. Almost never. Yeah, I'm, we we work on an acquisition number, so every time we get a new piece, it gets a new number. Um, when we retire an older number, because the the set number is tied to performance history, we don't reuse those numbers. So there are some empty spaces on our shelves. Um, and I know that you know one of the big upsides is supposed to be that you don't have to shift a numerical system. At some point, we are going to have to close up all those gaps and shift backwards. Um, I actually have a list of about. 750 numbers that we've retired um you know uh, you know excerpts for different young people's concerts that have specific cuts in them that kind of thing that are not going to be used again that we got rid of a lot of that prior to renovation because we didn't want to move anything and move it back that we weren't going to use going forward um so we did a good a good amount of work then um but we've tried to continue that moving forward um there are some very the very small number of instances where we have reused numbers and it's usually because the that the set number we got rid of did not have any performances attached to it um it's kind of a continuation of the house cleaning that we had been trying to do um so in those cases we will reuse those numbers um but for the most part we're not when that's you what say, I was, uh, yeah i'm sorry you. yeah at the marine uh, pen, we we were tending i think to reuse open numbers primarily yeah if they didn't have performance histories but i'm thinking even if they did we created like a, a dummy number system for for those situations where it had a performance history mm -hmm. so then we could reuse the working number mm -hmm. so yeah. but russ you were gonna say oh that's when you say retire christina mm -hmm. you you've thrown away this music but that makes perfect sense if you have information tied to that number you've got to retain that information somehow so you know what and when and where you just you threw out those pieces or did you scan anything was there any um, historical value done to that different things for different pieces for different reasons so a lot we just recycled um we have we've scanned some especially if there were specific roadmaps or cuts or um uh you know any type of performance history you know any type of performance information we wanted to retain we absolutely would scan before we retired those those numbers uh before we those sets um we've tried somewhat unsuccessfully to rehome some music um especially choral music if we had you know we've had some older sets of you know big chorus pieces where we've upgraded to a baron writer or piano vocal or something like that um and you know they're still certainly usable. You hate to throw it away, um, and so we've we have relationships, you know, with some churches and other choruses in the area. Um, but it's it, it it's never quite that simple. You know, we've tried, and then they sit in a pile for a year without being claimed, and then we finally give in and, and recycle them. So if anybody this is not the topic, but if anybody has has any good suggestions on on how better to you know rehome, especially chorus parts, I'm all ears. <laughs> All right, great. Thanks for leaping ahead and talking about uh, what happens when you have holes or gaps in a numerical system. And I, there are some things here on the slide about if you are going to actually open that number up and reuse it, like what all do you have to think about there? <laughs> Where are all the things and places you have to update? Um, I'm going to go back in the slides uh, and um, talk about some things we we haven't talked about yet. I did include this gorgeous picture that Christina sent of their beautiful library. <laughs> you came out that, way ahead in the renovation. Yeah, I remember you all working on this and I was so impressed. Not only, you, you know, you boxed all of this, which was a huge amount of work, but as you were applying the numbers to the brand new boxes, the, the numbers, the stickers you were buying were also color coded. Mm -hmm. um, have you found this helpful visually? Very much, yeah, because something leaps out if it's in the wrong you know, if it's misfiled. Um, so, you know, every number has its own color and, you know, you can just look down the shelf and see what leaps out as as out of pattern. Um, so it it is enormously helpful. We worked with a company called Patterson Pope, um, who was the authorized dealer of space saver shelving in our area. They also have another arm of their company um, called File Solve that did a lot of consulting and helped us develop the system that we're working in now. 
Oh, great. And you've been happy with that. They've been wonderful. The only, the only thing I didn't love was um, the software that makes the labels so that they match moving forward had a fee attached after a year, which had not been clear to me prior to that. So I got mad and said, heck no. And so I Photoshopped them now, which takes longer, but at least doesn't cost me anything. <laughs> Excellent workaround. Yeah. Um, in the days when there used to be paper files at medical offices, mm -hmm. um, those numbers, that's what those numbers remind me of. Exactly. Yeah. Doc we always say like a doctor's or a lawyer's office where the, mm -hmm. the letters are color coded. Yep. And you're still able to purchase the, the number labels? Okay. Um, I actually just use the Avery full, you know, eight and a half by 11 full sheet labels and print four on a page and cut them apart. Oh, okay. So, Cause they're, they're 11 inches tall, almost 11 inches tall. So. Well, thank you yeah. for telling us that tip. If you're looking to creatively uh, number <laughs> your yeah. collection and, and use yeah. labels, just print on Avery labels. It's not yeah, like you have to buy apart. special ones. Yeah. Um, do make yeah. sure it's not old label stock. Cause it may not stick permanently to your box and you may find yourself with a glue stick and you know, an unhappy afternoon, but uh, new label stock works very well. Good to know. Thank yeah. you. And I also have a question. Do you know if these boxes are acid free? They are. Yes, they are. They, we, again, it's through the same company um, and I'm happy to, you know, give their contact information to anybody that asks. Um, they worked with a box supplier. So they're acid free archival quality um, uh, cardboard and they actually have Velcro, Velcro um, closures. So if they fall off a cart. Oh yeah. They're going to be loud. Open. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a Velcro closure. Um, and then we store our, our parts digital, um, uh, vertically. It's a, it's a, um, it's like a box pocket. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. Yeah. We went through a lot. We really worked with them for years. We went through a lot of options before we settled on this and multiple widths to hold multiple sizes of works. Right, because you don't want the music slouching inside the box. Exactly. We also have um, um, in like cardboard inserts made out of the same cardboard. So if we have a very skinny, you know, pop tune, um, we can fill the rest of the box with with a couple pieces of the same archival quality cardboard, so that it stays upright and doesn't bend. Great, that's awesome. I'm glad you guys are thinking of that. And really, um, I think this sort of vertical storage is probably the most efficient. I really, really prefer it because you don't have to lift up the whole stack if you need to get something from, you know, from the bottom of the stack. Um, you'll see actually in that picture, some of our 11 by 17 scores, we do, sco we do store horizontally because if they were upright, we would lose a shelf, yeah. you know, we, because, of the, because of the amount of space it would take vertically. Um, but the vast majority of our collection is, is um, vertical like this. Awesome. Any thoughts, Russ? Um, that's a great idea. I've heard of the same kind of spacers being used in archival collections. You guys probably have them at LC too. Oh, yes. <laughs> Jane, I remember talking to you extensively about the Marine Band library renovation prior to ours, and you had a lot of good, a lot of good advice then. Oh, good. Yeah. I, um, the Marine Band isn't using a box system, although I'm it's it's awful sexy. <laughs> we were using um, what we call black jackets. I think at Philadelphia they call them carcasses. Uh, if anybody wants more information on that, let me know. Um, it's something one has to get custom made or make yourself. It's not um, really off the shelf commercial, off the shelf product at this point. So, um, if somebody was wanting to switch their library over from alphabetical to numerical we've talked about it would be just assigning the numbers uh, and start you know start at the beginning even if it's alphabetical you know eventually your library won't be alphabetical anymore <laughs> um and it's just as the works arrive correct you know you get a new work you just assign the next number uh some shops do choose to use leading zeros. That might be a practice of the past. People may not do that anymore. And their database programs may not require them to do that anymore uh, in order to sort correctly. Um, Excel is like one of those programs that needs leading zeros to sort correctly, but I think modern database programs probably don't. And don't know how many people actually need to sort by accession number. I think really the, the only time you'd want to do that is if you want to 
check your holdings on your shelf against your database records. Mm -hmm. And we call that, you know, in the parlance, that's a shelf read. So if you're trying to do a shelf read and check your collection and reconcile it, you would want to be able to sort by number. And Russ, I think shelf reading has been something you've been doing at the Naval School. Sadly, yes, uh, because of those <laughs> gaps in the numbers, but also I've, I've started at number one in a couple of my collections and I'm just working through everything. Uh, librarians prior to me were um, not necessarily official librarians. They were tasked with the job. Uh, you hope that they had an interest with it, but I'm discovering as I pull things off the shelf, several of my pieces aren't in my library catalog. They may as well be in the trash for that matter because I don't know they exist. So in that case, I do have to, uh, every now and then I'll try to print a numerical list just to check to make sure not only what open numbers I have, but why are they open? Is there actually a piece on the shelf? And you're right, it doesn't have to occur very often. But one thing I have found that's been more helpful, especially in a collection like mine that has letter prefixes and then accession numbers, if it's possible to structure your spreadsheet or your database in such a way to have a separate field for the prefix or the suffix and for the number, you can designate uh, them as a letter field or a number field and search and sort either way. Whereas in some systems, you're right, Jane, they excel in particular. You're going to sort by number. If it's CB1, the next one will be CB11 and then CB111 and then CB2 and CB20. And so it's, it, depending on the software, it might not work with you to get a numerical list. That's why it's uh, been more helpful to me to split those numbers up. Mm -hmm. um, and you were saying also as well, when we were talking earlier, if somebody chooses to work with leading zeros uh, in order for a computer to tell the difference between one, 11 and 111 and sort them correctly in order, you have to be able to forecast how many leading zeros are you going to need? <laughs> Can you yes. remind me why that was important? You ran into that problem? Well, uh, I'm sure my predecessors had no idea our collection would grow to 10,000 titles. So they were thinking short term. And I'm sure when they started, it was a issue of software. The old days, those of us who got into databases early on, the uh, size of the field sometimes was limited to a certain number of characters. So that's why you got those leading zeros, I suspect. They're all over the military. They love that kind of thing. But uh, my band pieces originally were three zeros and then a digit. So that would accommodate everything up to a thousand. Now that I'm in the 10,000s, that can be confusing and it doesn't help me in any of my searches or sorting. But Christine, I think uh, she's, you've got leading zeros in your system, is that right? We, we do. Um, we have, well, actually, it's funny. Um, we have four digits. We use OPAS for our, our um, database. We have four digits um, filled there. So, you know, zero, one, two, four is catalog number 124. Um, but we were high enough in our numbering system that when we were making the box labels, we said, you know what? We should add that fifth zero so that we can, you know, so we have the space on the label moving forward. Um, so I actually, I think we're we're around number 9378 or something like that. And I just recently emailed Tom Gatons to say, isn't there a way to just add a zero to every record? And there is. So I don't have to do it by hand. So uh, that'll be that'll be coming soon uh, to my library. Um, when you talk about Russ, when you talk about um, sort of collection designations, that picture Jane has up now, those are all CSO. Um, and we use that for just our standard classical subscription, you know, music director kind of sets. Um, we uh, are able to put that in a separate field in OPAS. It's the collection field in the library in OPAS. So we have a POPs designation, education, um, several options there. So like you were saying, you can search one or the other. Um, but the numbers are are sequential through both or through all of those collections. And, you know, as you saw in earlier pictures, um, they're next to each other on shelves. Yeah, like you can. The, oh, it doesn't help if I point at my screen. Um, you can see the, the top color on the on the labels there. That pink one is education and, and red is pop. So you'll see some some variation. We can it just helps things kind of jump out at you when you're looking for a specific set on the shelf. 
Okay, so that's interesting. Your your numbers run straight through all your different kinds of music, yes. whereas in some other numerical systems, um, I'll speak from my experience at the Marine Band, the regular concert band was R, and the number started at one through over 10,000. Um, and then we had the orchestra music, which started, you know, O, and it started back at one. Like, they they restarted the numbering system for each different collection. So I think this is the first collection that I've seen, Christina, where the numbers run straight through, like all the music is together on the show. Yes, and we actually made that conscious decision post renovation when we were moving, well, in the process of moving out and moving back in. Um, we, prior to our renovation, it was a complicated system. We had, we'd had basically one numbering system, but two different shelves, basically a symphony shelf and a pop shelf. So number 12 could be on either shelf, whether it had been used by the symphony or the pops. Um, and it became complicated. We would have duplicate sets. Um, and so when we moved out and moved back in, we decided to go with this system where everything is just in numerical order, um, regardless of, of collection. Um, in Again, in our main collection, you know, we, the I haven't talked so much about the chorus collection, um, which also has acquisition numbers, and that also starts at one again, and they have their own numbering system. Um, uh, and actually, same with the youth orchestra. So there are a couple other collections, but for the vast majority of our orchestra, it's in a single numerical system. Okay, now that makes that makes total sense. I'm glad you further explained that. Yeah. Good deal. Um... Uh, if anybody was curious about really how to how best to get started, um, I, I put this up here as an idea. <laughs> you know, at the Marine Band, our system was we wrote it down on paper. <laughs> That's ours. And, <laughs> oh, good. So you assign accession numbers using paper too. You have a yes. paper list. Yep. We yeah. then put it into our computer database, but I f I don't find it that easy to just look up the highest number, figure out what the next one should be. So we do actually keep a paper list goes back thousands of numbers. Have you ever found that list to be handy? Yes, yes, there have absolutely been sets we we're looking for and either didn't make it into the database or there was some something that did not reconcile. We've absolutely flipped back through it to figure stuff out. Yeah, that yeah. paper list really has come in handy. I, I know it could be done in Excel, but there's something a little safer about this paper list for exciting accession numbers, I find. And Russ is yeah. nodding his head. What has been your experience, Russ? <laughs> oh, uh, when was it? Uh, two weeks ago on a Friday, the power went out all around the base for five hours. Oh. So, and thank goodness, I still have several of my uh, lists printed out, sometimes by title, sometimes by composer. And I had to rely on those because computers down. I know at the Brain Band, we would uh, periodically um, print to PDF a report. Um, occasionally, I don't know if we okay printed it out once because it was massive. Um, but at least even the PDF came in super handy. You could keyword search it because the database would go down. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. So some sort of kind of backup. <laughs> really handy. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's a great idea because then it's... Yeah. You can always t take a copy of that home with you, whereas your database might be too big or a different system to, to right. back up. Good to have an offsite backup, as you probably found out the hard way, like we did too. Mm -hmm. And if you're using like a, a paper list to just assign the next number, um, because really that can probably be sometimes be the fastest. It's funny, analog can sometimes be the fastest way. Um, it really just can be simple as what's the next number, what's basic title, and you know your composer and, and probably need to know which edition because we've got a situation here where in our example you know you've got several of the same several editions of the same Beethoven <laughs> so enough information to just basically identify what you're what you're looking for because uh, invariably if you go to the shelf and look at the last number well if it's a new piece that you bought that's in the works in a concert program already what's on the shelf might not be the newest, most recent number. That one might be sitting on the shelf with other concert material. So the paper list sometimes will save you. Um, 
before I get to Courtney's question, I did want to point out uh, a photograph of something Russ talked about earlier. He was like, if you want the exception number everywhere it needs to be, you're going to have to put it there. This is part of that diligent record keeping. <laughs> so that includes um, an example we see here from the Cincinnati Symphony of, of them rubber stamping their accession number on every part, it looks like. And that's, of course, a practice you're continuing to do. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And you'll see higher up on the page, we also have a Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra stamp, that little square stamp um, uh, mm -hmm. under the title. So chances are good that your organization, you're already printed, uh, stamping your organization name on there. Um, we stuck with this two stamp system because we have such a nice big number stamp. Um, but actually for our May Festival Chorus, um, uh, we recently got them a new stamp and it was a combined May Festival Chorus and a, a number field that they can, so it's only, they're all, it's only a single stamp anyway per part that gives you both the organization and the number. Mm -hmm. It does. I remember fondly. I enjoyed stamping parts. It yeah. takes a few minutes, but you do it once for that piece of music and then you're good to go. <laughs> it's also a good job for volunteers if you're lucky enough to have volunteers. Yeah. With uh, good intentions. That's, I, and I think I sent an example to Jane. In the years past, uh, the library, at least in the military, used to be a uh, penance. So if you were late to show up for a rehearsal, Okay, go spend an hour in the library. Well, the people who get that job aren't necessarily most interested in giving it their best shot. So we've got many parts that have rubber stamp over the tops of notes or <laughs> other horrible things. Uh, if you have good, diligent librarians and volunteers, then that's a great project for them. Whoops. Ah. All right, I don't know where it is on my slide, Courtney, but Courtney was asking, what happens if you have multiple containers for a work? Um, and Courtney, if I'm not getting this right, just unmute yourself and, and speak up. But um, I know at the Marine Band, we used, we appended letters. So if we had three containers for orchestra P1605, the first container was 1605A, 1605B, and then we had 1605C. We didn't record that necessarily in the database at all. Um, it didn't matter to the computer how many jackets were or containers were on the shelf. Um, but honestly, if your piece is too big and it doesn't fit in one container, <laughs> you're going to need multiples. And we always stored the music in exactly the same way every time. It was always the scores are on top, the working set, and then extra parts. So usually, if we had three containers, all the scores were in the first container, A, the working set was in B, and the extra parts were in C. You could kind of count on that. Um, or for things like the planets, the A container was all the first movement. You know, some of our bigger works, you know, the B container was all, you know, the second movement. Um, so ways to organize with multiple containers vary. Um, But Christina, I think you guys have multiple containers, but you're not making any sort of, you don't make a distinction, do you? That's right. We have multiple containers. We don't have an additional digit or, or letter, like you mentioned. Um, we do add, um, and this is really because it didn't happen during the renovation. It, our data didn't get that granular. So we've just been doing it as we use sets. Um, we have an additional sticker that we put at the top of the box that just, and I run a whole bunch of ones that we think we're going to need. So scores, wins, strings, wins and scores, strings. Um, so it, it doesn't say one of two or two of two, but it'll say what is in the box. So it should be fairly clear that you're missing one. Oh, no, that's and a great again, point. Thank you. <laughs> um, again, because of the color coding, it's generally pretty clear when you pull something off the shelf, if the one, if this, the box right next to it looks identical. That's a really great way if you have multiple containers, like what is exactly in that box? <laughs> That's awesome. And it helps us fit everything back in at the back end as well, you know, mm -hmm. unless we've grown too much and we have to add one. Oh, you've had to even add a container then. Yes. Which actually isn't actually another reason why if we deaccession something and retire a number, if we don't close up that gap immediately, sometimes it gets filled with extra scores or 
something like that. That's a good idea. So, you know, elsewhere on that shelf or in that area. So it give, it allows us a little bit of shifty flexibility space. You know, that's right. I remember that now. We needed that too at the Marine Band, even with a numerical system. You get a you know a new conductor and you might get a new set of parts or you know well not new set but more Bigger scores new section yeah yeah because you're recording anything like that yeah. so good reminder for anybody who's thinking about implementing a numerical system don't pack those shelves tight leave yourself some wiggle room <laughs> <laughs> things are going to grow <laughs> so Courtney great question because it led to a good uh, other thought process too. <laughs> All right, we're already at, um, we've got 13 minutes left in our hour. We've, I believe, covered everything we set out to talk about. Are there any other questions? Because we've been talking pretty um, nonstop, <laughs> although folks have been good about jumping in. Oh, Katie, yeah, go ahead and unmute. Hello. Um, I am wondering what uh, any thoughts would be on sort of a combined system. So a single title has a single number, but you're going to put multiple editions under said number. Does this sound like a huge no-no? Am I asking for disaster? Or <laughs> what, are, what are the thoughts on, on the experts who have gone through with this process? Um, my answer would be it depends. Um... Sometimes we did that at the Marine Band, sometimes we didn't. In the cases where we would assign it a new number, it's because we really wanted to keep the edition separate and we didn't want them getting mixed up in the folder. Like sometimes we would have to build a folder with the old edition and the new edition, but the number was helping us identify which was which um, in case it was very important <laughs> to be able to distinguish. Um, but what say uh, Russ and Christine? I can see where it would be handy to have one location for Beethoven fifth, but especially as your music director decides they want the newest, the sexiest version, you're going to want to be able to d distinguish, I think, between that old Kalma set and that new Baron Rider set. And the easiest way to do that probably is just to give them separate numbers. But then that's on the librarian to record that information so you can tell easily which is which. Yeah, I agree. It's it's frequent that, you know, especially if we're looking ahead at a new season, a new, pro, uh, you know, new Boeing process, something like that, I will pull multiple sets of the same work that are in different locations. So I can see why it would be useful to have them all filed together. Um, but I would worry about, you know, <laughs> cross-contamination, you know, something will slip in where it doesn't belong and you'll be missing the Baron Ryder oboe two part from the other set. I can, I think it might be asking for trouble, but I, I really have not tried it. Well, I'm thinking too about performance histories, um, keeping those um, separate. Um, so in your database system, having them at different accession numbers helps you have a different performance history situation for one edition versus another. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I hope we answered your question, Katie. Thanks for asking that. Yeah, thanks so much. Courtney, I know uh, switching to a numerical system was something you were thinking about. Have you gone ahead and done that? Or where, may, may I ask where you are in that journey? <laughs> Still at the beginning of the process, um, we'll be moving into our new renovated space, um, hopefully in the fall. And um, it's something that we need to do, I think, over the summer while we prepare for that, because we're just running out of room and the shifting has become too much for us. And were you also um, having to consider remote storage? Yes, we are. And you really felt like accession numbers would help in that situation? I believe so. Yeah, right now um, we have some chorus music offsite, but I believe um, after our move back to the renovated hall, we're going to have to have more music offsite. So I, um, I think it's inevitable that we're going to have to move to the numerical system just to keep track of everything. Um, how many works are you up to now? Or how many titles do you know? Um, ooh, 
I had the number and I can't remember at the moment, but it's um, it's nowhere near the amount of the Marine Band or uh, Cincinnati, but we're in the thousands. So probably a couple thousand somewhere around there. Yeah, I can't help but wonder how many Mola orchestras are have grown to the point where they really having to consider this now. <laughs> We're also purchasing more and more new additions, like Russ mentioned, and so just finding space for that and trying to figure out, you know, if we need these older sets. We, we, um, when we moved to our temporary space, we donated quite a few old sets, and now when we're trying to figure out how much room we have in the new space, is trying to determine, well, is there anything else that a we can move off site, or b that we might not need anymore as well. What are some of the concerns you have? going into this project? Any any overarching worries? Um, well, mainly just time constraints, you know, and trying to get it done on top of prepping music for our, you know, regular season as well as our summer season. So I think it's just that and utilizing volunteers, as Russ mentioned, at least to not only get the numbering system started, but stamping parts and everything. Um, I think that's a good point. Mm -hmm. I thought about that, you know, I talk about stamping all the parts for thousands of titles, and I wonder if something to, I don't know, this could be asking for a disaster, but like stamp it as you use it kind of thing, you know, as it gets pulled off the shelf, that may be just a long, over many, many, many years kind of project, but that way it, it gets you into a numerical system quickly. True. On the surface. <laughs> we actually did that to some extent. Um, we had... I mentioned we had a couple, some duplicate numbered sets. Like, um, so we we actually did or assign some numbers, sort of in theory, um, and just stick the pay the stick the sets in a box with the so the box had the new number, and the parts did not. Um, and either as we've used them, or if we have a day with volunteers and not a lot of jobs, um, we have a backup project for them. Um, so we have done that, and it hasn't led to disaster yet. Knock on wood. Yeah, leaving yourself a good note paper trail of don't forget to stamp this set. <laughs> um, Courtney, I'm going to put you on the spot and just say, I hope sometime next year, or, you know, whenever this move to a numerical system is done, it'd be fascinating if you wrote about it for Marcato. <laughs> I'd be glad to once it's all behind me. Yeah. <laughs> but Listen. I really appreciate you all taking the time to go through this because it just it helps me think through it and, you know, questions that I need to consider and things I haven't even thought about. So I really appreciate you all leading this session. You're welcome. Well, when you asked about this, I thought, okay, how many other people are also thinking about this? You are probably not the only one. Oh yeah. Nishan is like, yeah, you have to write that. <laughs> but yeah, less of a how-to, but more of a how I survived. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give it one more awkward brief pause for any last questions. And any final thoughts uh, from our panel today? I would say that uh, there are times you could use, say, a closed system. Uh, I have received some donations from past directors or something like that. If it's a collection that I know will not grow at all, I can apply whatever system I want to that and it will sit by itself. It will never expand. It will probably never decrease. And I can, it doesn't matter what system I apply to it. I can use numbers, letters, alphabet, and it's easy to find material that way, but it's also not necessarily a working collection. Yeah, it's true. I think as we've been talking, we each have some you know some sub collections some variations some special cases um and i think it seems like our our despite our best intentions there you know we we can kind of systems kind of grow and adapt and settle in over time and i think it is really nice to take a step back like we've been doing and um reassess how well it's working what we should think about doing next time and See how it works for others so thanks for putting this together jane thank you amy thank you all so much for joining us and thank you ross and for christina for 
um, <laughs> agreeing to do this. Uh, it's been a lot of fun working with you on this. So, and I hope it's helpful to everyone. So, all right. Well, if there's nothing further, we'll say goodbye.